You've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here. I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, our guest for this week's show is real estate investment expert Brian Davison. Brian is the founder and CEO of Equialt, an opportunistic real estate investment firm based here in Tampa, Florida. He drives the Equialt team to success by using a skill set that includes notable achievements in business management, marketing, sales, deal structuring, operations, and consulting. Additionally, he has experience in institutional and private lending that highlights his management ability, analytical skills, and vibrant overall business growth. From the real estate recession of the 1990s to today's ever-changing real estate market, Brian has been able to adapt and overcome the day-to-day challenges presented with running a high-growth investment company. Equialt's focus spans residential, commercial, and boutique resorts throughout a litany of different markets. Now, guys, I'm very excited to get onto the show with Brian, but before we do, here's a few quick housekeeping items I'd like to quickly run through with you. First and foremost, I want to wish each and every one of you an awesome 2019. Now, I I hope that through the information shared on this podcast, I can help each and every one of you achieve your investment goals here this year. And just so you know, I I really am here to help each and every one of you. In fact, there are a good number of you, hundreds of you that I've connected with and even partnered with over these last five years that we've been doing this podcast. And uh, I'm eternally grateful for each and every one of you. Now, Maybe you need you know capital for a deal or an operational partner for a deal uh, that you've sourced. Uh, well, we're here for you. We're always looking for partnership opportunities. Uh, we can pay large finder fees. Uh, we can be an operational partner. We can bring capital to a deal. Okay, so we're always open to investment opportunities. Maybe you just need some guidance, some general guidance. You're just getting started. Well, we can help you with that as well. As I'd mentioned, I've spoken to hundreds of you over the last five years. We offer a 30-minute free phone call every Friday. You can sign up for that call by going to my website, kevinbupp.com. Every Friday, I've had the opportunity to speak with four of you each Friday for literally five years going now. So I've spoken to a lot of you over the years. Maybe you're just looking to diversify your investment portfolio and you're considering mobile home parks as an investment vehicle. As you guys know, that's what we specialize in. Okay. So if you're looking to diversify and looking to get into a different niche, more specifically mobile home parks, well, I've got a solution for that as well. Bottom line, I just want to be a resource for you guys. And just in case you weren't aware of it, I'm also the host of another weekly podcast that goes by the name of the Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. Now, on this show, we cover why our team absolutely loves mobile home parks and why we have chosen this asset class as our core focus. Now, on this show, we go into granular detail of how we've built our mobile home park business, how we source off-market deals. And I say off-market deals. I mean, that's even in this really highly competitive real estate landscape that we find ourselves in today. Okay. Most of our deals are coming off market. And then lastly, on this show, we show you how to achieve huge returns in the mobile home park space. Now, be sure to go check it out. And there's a free gift that I will tell you about that if you go to that show, I'll give you directions on how to access the free gift. We will give you the exact cold call script that we use in-house here in our own very own company. It's a cold call script that we've kind of tweaked and honed in on over the years. And it's what we use to outbound dial mobile home park owners and property owners. Okay. And we'll give you that exact cold call script for free if you go listen to that show. Okay. Go listen to one of the shows. We'll give you instructions on how to access that cold call script. And uh, I think you'll be happy that you did. Okay. It's an awesome free gift. Another quick update I'd like to share with you guys. We've had some incredible success over the last couple of years in the mobile home park space, but more specifically, our most recent investment offering, which is the MHP Growth and Income Fund number two, we launched this last May with an initial target capital raise of $10 million, which we fully subscribed in a short five weeks. Now, we had a very active 2018. We purchased eight mobile home communities. Uh, This represented over 800 lots. Now, I will say this, 
most of you guys know this if you listen to the show, but maybe not. So I'm going to repeat myself. We pride ourselves in our ability to source strong off-market deals via direct-to-owner marketing efforts. That's what we excel at. We're incredible at it. We've been doing it for a long time, and we truly consider ourselves masters of sourcing off-market opportunities. Now, the exciting part is that only one of those eight communities that I just mentioned that we purchased in 2018 was purchased through a broker channel. And so seven of those deals we did off market with our direct to owner marketing efforts. Okay. That, that allowed us the ability to negotiate incredibly strong acquisition pricing and we didn't have to compete against the marketplace that typically will drive the price out of reach. And so again, this is really where we shine. And so with that, we're rolling into 2019 with a very strong pipeline. And we just recently opened up the second tranche of the MHP Growth and Income Fund 2 investment opportunity. Okay, So we opened up a second tranche and we're going to be raising an additional $10 million. And so if you missed out on investing with us last year and you have an interest in partnering with our team, a team that literally we excel at what we do here in the mobile home park space, and we love the opportunity to, to work with you. So if you're an accredited investor, you're interested in learning more about partnering with me and my team on future deals, I'd love to have a discussion with you, have a conversation with you. So you can visit our website, invest.sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. Again, that's invest.sunrisecapitalinvestors.com. You can create a free account inside our secure investment portal. Inside here, you'll have immediate access to the offering docs and webinars where we cover intimate details of this investment opportunity. And so I'll just leave you with this. Based on how fast we filled up in that very first tranche last May, I'm quite confident that this current opportunity won't last very long. So I really do look forward to the opportunity to, to working with you. And lastly, guys, before we get onto the show with Brian, if you happen to be in the Tampa Bay area, you find yourself here for business or pleasure, I love the ability to connect with you if you've got some extra time during your visit. So if you want to reach out to me, let me know when you're coming into town. Just go to my website, kevinbupp.com, and just submit a message on the Contact Me page, and I'll get back to you about us connecting and getting together during your visit. So I, I surely would love to buy you coffee or lunch, whatever you might have time for during your visit to the Tampa Bay area. All right, guys. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest for today's show, Brian Davison. Brian, how you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. I know you're super busy, and uh, you know it's funny. We just found out during our discussions uh, before recording here that we're literally across the bridge from one another. Uh, Brian's also in the Tampa market. I'm over on the other coast. It's funny the, the 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 disconnect, Brian, that happens between those two darn bridges that exist between Tampa and the West Coast over here. I'm over in the, the Clearwater, Dunedin area. So I've got a lot of friends that live in Tampa, but it doesn't seem that they come over this way that often. I don't find myself going to Tampa that much either, other than the airport, which is pretty strange. <laughs> <laughs> in any event, Brian, I appreciate you. It's almost you. like two separate cities. You're right. It, it really right. is. It really is. In any event, appreciate you coming on the show. And so what I'd sure. love to do is for those folks that aren't familiar with you, that aren't familiar with your company, maybe take a few minutes Give us a little bit more of an expanded background of yourself and then also of your firm, Equial. Sure. So my name is Brian Davison. I've been in real estate one way or another since 1996. Mm -hmm. I've been had Equial in one of its current forms since uh, 2008. We are a product of the crash. We did not... Uh, some people like to give me a pat on the back today and say, oh, you must have done a great job coming through the crash. And I say, absolutely not. I was buried by it. And mm -hmm. uh, what you see today is completely a product of the crash of 2008, 2009. So 2008, 2009, I started buying properties at the auctions, just like you see on TV, and uh, grew that into the portfolio we have today of about 533 doors and different product lines for different investors. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. I, I want to talk a little bit about that crash. I, I had no idea that Equi Auto, or maybe not, it wasn't that name at that point in time, but ultimately uh, you were investing prior to the crash and that you had some challenging times there, as, right. as, so, as, as did I. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. And uh, but, but more importantly, how, how you were able to you know pick yourself back up and get back on the right trajectory again. Uh, yeah. So uh, if I tell you the rest of the story, it might even be a little more, uh, you know, uh, please juicy. do. So, please do. So I was in lending and I had grown up through lending through the 1990s and all the way to the early 2000s. And I'd own my own brokerage shop with our own warehouse lines. Mm -hmm. um, I had an office in Tampa, an office in uh, Las Vegas, an office in Scottsdale. And so I was literally part of the crash. You know, we started losing our insurance on our warehouse lines and losing investors in 2006. I was losing money 
all the way through 2007 and finally had to close down the lending company in the summer of 2008, right before, you know, the Lehman crash and the whole world found out we were in trouble. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a married man with a child and soon to be pregnant wife, a little bit of desperation perhaps. And, you know, the only thing going on, I have to be in Las Vegas at the time, the only piece of real estate activity going on in Las Vegas was, was the auction. And so uh, that's the only thing I knew how to do. So I had a handful of investors that would still entertain the idea of investing in real estate, would still talk to me about it. And so I, I gathered up a couple of investors, friends and family as well, and literally went down to the auction house there in Las Vegas and just started watching the auction take place, started learning about how it worked, and then eventually got involved on a one-by-one -one basis and uh, eventually grew that to where we are today. Hmm. Very interesting. So you, yeah. you picked yourself back up pretty quickly, but it sounded like your back was, uh, you, you're kind of pushed against the wall. I yeah. mean, you're stuck in a corner. You've had a, a pregnant wife, a child on the way. You had responsibilities is the best way to put it, right? <laughs> certainly, certainly. Yeah. You know, it's uh, life handed me the no plan B option. You know, it was just something to keep moving forward thing. Yeah, you know, it's interesting in that I feel like I'm, I'm very good about picking myself back up, but uh, I, I wouldn't say that I did as quickly as you uh, after the crash. And although I, I wasn't married, I didn't have a child at that point in time. I, I had you know got married shortly thereafter, a few years after, and I've got a couple kids now. And I, I'm sure it would have been a little bit different, you know, given the circumstances that you were facing. Not that I wasn't ready to to, to get on with my life and push past all the negative downsides of what occurred. Now, a little bit different on our side. We did have a mortgage company, but I had sold off my interest. Uh, not good timing on my part at all. It, wasn't, it was just more luck than anything to a partner back in 05. And about a year and a half later, he was shut down. He had, he had to close on the shop. Yeah. Yeah, I, I felt really bad because I did, no one saw it coming. Yeah. In 2005, it was you know things were still humming along, and he thought he made a great purchase. Now, I need to really focus my efforts on our our real estate portfolio, which was really my primary interest and focus at that point in time, and ultimately lost a lot of the investments that uh, that I had purchased over a five year span. Uh, we were in Southwest Florida, as you know, from yeah. basically Tampa all the way down to Fort Myers. It was uh, catastrophic, and there's no other way to put it. But it took a number of years to dig myself back out and and really come back out of it with a positive outlook. And it sounds like you jumped back in right away. And the good thing about that is you, you were able to capitalize on a lot of the, you know, the blood in the streets, really is the best way to put it. Whereas that, there were some that left over uh, in 2011 and, and, and there on forward. But you know, the 2009, 10, beginning 11 era, there was just, I mean, there's just a litany of you know, foreclosed properties and stuff going to auction. I mean, the banks couldn't get rid of it fast enough. And so it sounds like you got in exactly at the right time. And so let's talk about the plan for your company, you know, Equialt, kind of have your, your structured. One of the things I noticed on your website is that you guys do not participate in leveraged assets, which is quite interesting in a world where everyone over leverages everything. Not us, but I mean, generally speaking, I feel like everyone's always going to get a loan and they always will take whatever the highest LTV the bank's willing to give them. And again, that's not really how we run our business, but yours is literally the complete opposite where you're going in with zero leverage. And I'm, I'm assuming that has a little bit to do with what happened in 2007, 2008, does it not? It has everything to do with it, really. Yeah. You know, once uh, it, it, was, it was a very deep emotional time for me, you know, not just financially, right? So I was in my mid 30s and it was a very slow moving time when we were buying houses at the auction there in Las Vegas. Uh, I was literally gathering up, you know, $50,000, $100,000 at a time from people to go buy, let's say, condos at the auction. And so you had, I had a lot of free time on my hands to think about things in life in general. And I, you know, you know, pain is one of the greatest le teachers in life. And so mm -hmm. I decided, you know, right or wrong, uh, because I do hear people argue against my business model very intelligently because I don't use leverage. So I leave a lot of money on the table, but I decided that I was never going to be at risk at it again. I, did, I, I wasn't that aggressive. I wasn't that hungry and I wasn't going to put my family in that position ever again. I wasn't mm -hmm. going to believe the banks. I wasn't going to believe Wall Street anymore. And I wanted to do everything I could to disassociate myself personally and my new business from ever needing Wall Street bank money again. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, in the very beginning, just, just to be fair, no banks were ever going to give me money anyway, right? All right. <laughs> um, no, no bank is going to give you money on a distressed asset with no title insurance. Sure. Right? Well, no chance, right? But there was another day in 2011, 2012, when certainly they were coming around and they're like, wow, you have this cash flow performing portfolio. We'd be interested in giving you a, you know, a bridge loan or, you know, some kind of uh, financing on it. Fantastic. I, I have no interest because I'd already stabilized myself and grown past that, I thought. Mm -hmm. So 
but certainly, as I just mentioned a minute ago, my people that raise capital for me are, are very smart from an accounting point of view, from a business point of view. They do let me know that I leave you know, several points on the table every year as far as not using leverage. So there certainly is an argument that there's an, always an appropriate amount of leverage. But the truth is, when there's a crash, the appropriate leverage amount, nobody knew what that was. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. So I just decided just to keep plugging forward and do what we're doing without any leverage. And it's sort of become uh, what differentiates us in the marketplace. Hmm. Generally speaking, again, I know you have multiple different buckets and, you know, different components of your business behind the scenes, the different asset classes and different markets that you're in. But is there one overlaying structure of how you're, how you structure between your general partner and limited partner side of your business being that you're literally taking no leverage? Yeah. So the way I structure all my entities is all my investors have, they they do not have a direct interest in the uh, investment. So it does allow me complete management discretion. That's how I always build my investments. And if that doesn't work for someone respectfully, it doesn't work for me either because, and and this goes back to the investment strategy we have. It's, I I like to think of myself as a no bias guy. Mm -hmm. Um, My specialty is just simply trying to find yield and piece of real estate. That's it. So this real estate could be a small resort. It could be a piece of commercial property. It could be a uh, you know, small single family. So we really try to look at anything and everything where, we, where there's a dislocation between what we can get the asset for and what we think the market will pay for it after maybe some work is done to it. Hmm. How do you guys make decisions on what asset class you're going to go after? So you're chasing yield. I get that. Yeah. But you know, it's a lot of folks really preach to focus. And I'm one of them. Uh, and yeah. I, I know my personality type and I know it's, it's really challenging to master two or three things, let alone just one, right? One that, you know, today our business is manufactured housing. How have you guys been able to master, you know, the variety of assets that you you're out there acquiring? I know that you, so you've got single family homes, got uh, what multifamily, you've got some commercial, uh, you mentioned resorts in there. Uh, are there any other types of assets that are within your portfolio today that are outside the norm? I wouldn't say they're outside the norm. We also are involved in building out two small breweries hmm. for craft brewery companies. They're, they're single use. But let me, let me jump back and, and, and reiterate and support your belief. As in the very beginning, when I was getting started, it was only small single family. Um, I had I had zero room in my life for anything else because it was such a messy transaction buying houses at the auction and so time consuming with the research and then you know getting the asset and making it whole. It, we really really were a one trick pony for a very very long period of time, as they say. But then you know I had some staff come on. We manage everything internally, so we had to, I had a bunch of staff come on. Uh, we've got twelve people here in Tampa, another four people in Phoenix that do, uh, to handle the investor relations side. And so, you know, people get bored in their jobs. And so the interesting thing is when we think about taking on another asset, when we're doing our due diligence on the project, I'll literally, we'll just have an open meeting with it and say, yeah, so does this interest anybody? We've got to go through probably six to nine months worth of EPA paperwork and get bonds with the attorneys and deal and just chase down the government and make them sign off on things. Does anybody want to, you know, do that? And then they just probably <laughs> say, yeah, I don't mind. Uh, I'll do that. And so I think the office really enjoys the fact that they can either be working on small resorts or they can be working on, you know, development, or they can just be managing a single family portfolio and just talking to tenants for a little while. Um, Mm -hmm. And I let, I let everybody kind of move around. I'm real, I'm real big on my manuals in the office as far as like what tasks, what procedures for each task. And so everybody's allowed to review somebody else's manual and their job. Um, I really hire for talent and a personality, not exactly the specific job skill set. That's the great thing about real estate, right? I think that none of it's rocket science. And if anybody does make a mistake, no patient on the operating table is going to die. So Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of flexibility and and, uh, wiggle room there as far as giving people chances to do different things in a company our size. Yeah. Very interesting. No, I, I love the philosophy behind that. And uh, there's a right button for every seat. And uh, you're right. We, we hire the same exact way. We look at, you know, overall skill set, not next, not necessarily specific skills pertaining to the position we might be hiring for. Right. And just how talented is that yeah. person overall? And anyone can learn anything. Right. I mean, it's just, oh, like, right, that, right. you know, again, this isn't rocket science. And so I, I think that's really the best approach to take. Now, I want to talk about maybe some of the markets you guys are focused in. I know that obviously you probably got some stuff here in the Tampa Bay area, but you mentioned you've got a team out West as well. So obviously you've got some assets out that way. Is that the two primary markets that you're in? Was it Phoenix? Is that what you had mentioned? So the the employees I have in Phoenix are the investor relations department. And that really just came across as, uh, you know, it just grew organically. It wasn't planned. So 
I wouldn't really recommend most people have their company split over two different you know, time zones, but uh, it works out well for me. So the investor relations really handles a lot of my legal paperwork, a lot of customer service calls, K-1s to investors, all mm-hmm. that kind of almost mundane stuff, and maybe even a little public relations as far as talking to the investment advisors that direct capital to us. So that is what happens out in the Phoenix area. So no, I'm not, I don't have any assets out that way just yet. We like you know, Tennessee, we like uh, New Jersey and Central Florida. We are interested in uh, some spots in Colorado. We think that's a pretty uh, interesting place to be in, but we haven't bought anything there yet. Hmm. Very interesting. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here with Sunrise Capital Investors. As you are hopefully already well aware, if you've been a listener for any period of time, my goal has always been to provide you with as much value as I possibly can through my two podcasts, Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow and the Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. As our audience continues to grow, literally, we've been downloaded millions of times by folks in over 125 countries. I've had thousands of people reach out looking to get involved in our niche. And that's the phenomenal niche of mobile home park investing. For those that don't know, I've been a full-time real estate investor for nearly 20 years now, and I've personally invested in and have owned apartment complexes, various commercial properties, hundreds of single-family rentals, and I've interviewed some of the most successful investors in just about every other asset class, and I've arrived at this one very simple conclusion. Mobile home parks are hands down the best investment I've found to date. Why? They provide investors with the best risk-adjusted returns out of any other real estate sector that I've seen. Investing in real estate can get complicated, and I really want to simplify this process for you. If you're someone who wants to diversify away from the uncertainty of Wall Street and allocate a percentage of, of your real estate portfolio to mobile home parks, but maybe you don't have the time nor the inclination to personally locate good deals yourself, then our team will do it for you. At Sunrise Capital Investors, our team specializes in the acquisitions and management of undervalued and highly profitable mobile home parks. And we are now providing accredited investors with an opportunity to participate directly alongside our team in our up-and-coming deals. And let me say this. I believe that we are hands down the best in our space at sourcing highly profitable off-market deals. That's really what makes us unique in this niche and as investment managers. As stewards of your capital, we truly are aligned with our investors. We've structured our investment fund so that we as a company are incentivized in the same way the investor is, which is through the performance of the investment itself. In addition, we want to make sure that we not only make money for our investors, but that they understand how it's being made. That's why we provide our accredited partners with a private monthly podcast that walks them through the detailed updates on how their investment is performing. And we're very transparent, providing you with the good, the bad, and the ugly at times. And so if you'd like to learn more about the partnership opportunities with our team here at Sunrise, please go visit sunrisecapitalinvestors.com and click on the investors link to get signed up. It's absolutely free and you'll get placed on the priority list of when new opportunities come along. Also, feel free to call us at 833 Cash Flow Without the O. Again, that's 833 Cash Flow Without the O. And one of our investor relations team members will help you schedule an appointment to speak with one of our managing principals. If you have questions, go ahead and schedule a call and let's get on the phone and talk. And with that, guys, I'd like to leave with one last thought. From the time that I wake up in the morning to the time that I lay my head down the rest of the evening, My number one priority with everything I do, whether it be recording this podcast, working for our investors, helping each of you reach your investment goals, to providing a great experience to each of our residents who reside in our communities, is to add huge amounts of value to everyone that I come in contact with. Now, with that being said, I look forward to the opportunity of bringing value to you through Sunrise and through this podcast. Thank you for your time. Now, let's go ahead and get back to the show. Your investor profile, uh, the folks that are investing in these different properties, uh, who you raise the capital from, what would you say the general, you know, overall profile looks like of that individual? Like I, I can, you know, I can kind of put our investors in two different buckets and, but mostly uh, our investors are looking for, they're looking for cash flow and they're looking at certain target returns and they know they've got some options out there. Um, 
especially with a lot of the crowdfunding. No, it's okay. Especially with a lot of different crowdfunding sites out there, it's becoming more readily visible to different alternative options, real estate uh, investment options that exist in the overall marketplace. And so there's, you can kind of compare one to another. You can compare one sponsor to another. And so back to the original question is, being that you don't obviously don't have leverage, I don't know what your returns look like, but they obviously are lower than what they would be if you had leverage. And so who is that investor that finds the comfort in the no leverage approach and is willing to essentially take less returns in exchange for it? Yeah. So a uh, great question. So uh, the, the people that get involved with us on our, as a product, like, you know, they don't, they don't know us intimately or personally. Right. But they, they like the equity ultimate product simply because they see us as more stable and we can be, and they can be a little more transparent with them with the paperwork. And if we buy an asset and it's titled in one of the LLCs that we own that funnels up to the fund, they can, they can see what it is. They know that I haven't leveraged it or under leveraged it. It just takes it out of the equation. So the, typically the people that invest with us are, are okay with the, a slightly lower yield, but what they're really looking for is the stability of the asset. And, and so that, that seems to work so far. And, and, a lot, and a lot of the investors are quite simply, you know, retired baby boomers looking for cash flow. I think like you mentioned, they're not looking for the big sexy swing. They're not trying to flip properties to grow their net worth. They're typically, from what I understand, preserving their net worth and just looking for that stable cash flow. So, so we appeal to maybe a slower moving, less, uh, less aggressive investor, for lack of a better word, I guess. Yeah. 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 I know that makes sense. What has you guys excited today as far as the opportunities that are maybe currently in your pipeline? I mean, are they still a majority single family investments so, or? I- I love the single family market. I think the big secret most people miss on it is that it's the largest asset class in America. I think mm-hmm. it has the most dislocations all around. It just takes a lot of work. You know, you have a lot of diligence uh, and, and research that you have to go through. Mm-hmm. So I've always got an eye on that market. I think there's always a spot there. The bad news is there's a lot of people doing investing in real estate now. And so there's a lot of people that, that think they understand single family homes because they own one themselves. And so they're willing to put their money into it, which kind of crowds us out to a large degree. So I'm always looking at the asset class. I love it. I like it a lot. I feel fantastic about it in the long run. But you know, today, the things I'm excited about are, this is going to sound crazy, but the small resorts. Florida's loaded with them. Florida has just a ton of beach, right? All the way around the state. And the uh, small resorts that are right around the 2 to $4 million price point are super interesting because typically that's harder for the novice investors to pull their money in to buy that size of asset, 2 to $4 million. Also, the two to four million dollars small resorts all around the state, they're typically, you know, uh, run by mom and pop that are living there, maybe taking some cash into the table. So it's hard to show the revenue and understand that market condition, like what it's actually doing to perform. And clearly, the two to four million dollar resorts are way too small for any of the publicly traded REITs to get involved mm-hmm. in. It's just not worth their energy. So I really like that asset class. That's the substantial returns on it. They're fun. It's another way to supplement an income portfolio because it's a different type of renter. It's a little seasonal, clearly, but you know, it definitely has its own life cycle, so it is kind of predictable. So I enjoy that a lot as far as supplementing the portfolio, and there's still some value there because there's a ton of it around Florida still. Do you have a few of those in your portfolio now? I do, yeah. And, and the first one that got me going was, I'll admit, I was a little bit scared about it. Uh, we got it from a foreclosure from a credit union. So my, my backup strategy was, it's a, it's a small resort where it's got uh, 14 individual bungalows, and each one of those bungalows was its own APN number. Hmm. So I knew worst case scenario, if we just were horrible at managing a small resort, uh, I could level it and build condos there but for every APN I had. So, yep. uh, you know, I, I recommend having a good backup strategy before you jump into it because it is its own little monster. But uh, we really we enjoyed it and it worked out well. As far as like going forward with that strategy, I mean, what, what are you seeing as far as that at two to four million range, uh, f- smaller Florida resorts? Like, what kind of uh, you know going in cap rates are you able to buy these at? Uh, you know, normalized cap rates. I mean, I know that showing you know looking at the profit and loss statement of some of these mom and pops. I mean, it's like looking at a different language because they are horrible you know bookkeepers yeah. and taking cash under the table, but. From a normalized standpoint, what are you seeing? I mean, is it is it nearing a double digit? Uh, or is it high single digits? For sure. Really? Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're close to just over 20% return on, on two out of three. Um, and the third one may get there or it may not. I'm not really clear yet because I may have paid too much for it. But I still like it because it, it benefits from being in the area. And I think our management, it's easy for access to. 
you know, yes, the, the small resorts, you know, um, because they don't get amenities like room service and these higher end things, these people check themselves in and out, electronic lock box on the door, you know, with technology these days, you really can manage these things remotely if you just train people to accept that when they go there. And there's just a lot of seasonal people that come to us from Canada or the, or the Northeast mm-hmm. uh, to get out of their winters. And we just find it to be a really, uh, it's, it's really a cool little asset class, I think. Uh, Very interesting. Like so what are you doing to proactively go after those opportunities? I mean, what does your deal pipeline look like and what is the primary source of it? So we like, yeah, we like to stay geographically where we are. We're located in central yeah. Florida primarily. So it, we're in that market and a lot of it's door to door stuff. A lot of it's just, uh, you know, contacting local realtors who heard a rumor about a guy. Some of these mom and pop places, they don't want to pay the real estate commission. So, you know, oftentimes this is going to sound interesting, but I offer to pay it. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, because I know if I save enough on the deal that I don't really care about the couple of extra points, it's not a mental sticking point for me yep. or financials. So I, I do that kind of a thing. So, yeah, you know, it's really, I really just shop it based on location. You know, you want to be on one of the main drags of the, of the road. You know, I try to, whenever time I walk one of those properties, I try to think about it, you know, if I was, if I was getting out of the main snow, and I was in the 150 to 200 dollar a night room stay. You know, would this be a place I would lo- that I'd like to see on TripAdvisor? You know, yeah. you just kind of put yourself in those shoes, and it, I think as long as you do something like that, you'll be okay. Do you find that those digital platforms like TripAdvisor or VRBO are they really the lifeblood of this type of business opportunity? I would say so, absolutely. Yeah. You know, each one of them is its own. Uh, you know, to be technical for the real estate side, it's its own LLC and own business, mm-hmm. and each one of them has its own Booking.com, TripAdvisor, you know, set up its own website. And so, you know, there's there's some pitfalls with that as well. I mean, like uh, you know, people you know, obviously take towels on the on the physical side, but also if they make a complaint, you know, they can get their card reversed, this and that. So. You know, it's it's a little bit messier in that regard than just putting in a 12 month lease in a single family home. Mm-hmm. Um, but the volume is there. Um, some of these guys will stay for three months at a time. It's not just a single night or a single week. Uh, so you know, it's its own little animal, so to say. But it, it does work out well. At the end of the year, you look at the P and L, and you're like, yeah, we're going to do that again. Yeah, right, right. So t- talking about the property management side, again, you got a lot of different moving uh, pieces of, of your business, uh, single family, small resorts, and the other various types of real estate you guys own in your portfolio. Uh, have you have you been able to get your property management side? I, you said they're in-house, so I don't know if it's one person or multiple people, but have you seen challenges with them trying to adapt to these different property types? Because obviously, as you and I both know, running a, you know, a, a 20-door resort, waterfront resort, Resort and you know somewhere in Florida, in the coast of Florida, is completely different than than a single family home uh, in Tampa, which is completely different than a C grade apartment complex in you know Nashville, Tennessee. Right? I mean, like they're all different animals. They've all got their different challenges. I would say that the resort is probably the most challenging, right? Because it's got a lot of a transient nature to it. There's more moving parts. I'm assuming some of these right. things have swimming pools, and again, as you mentioned, people stealing stuff, you know, taking towels with them, and <laughs> so yeah. And the and resorts are interesting. Interesting enough are more monitored, right? Because people give reviews right away. Mm-hmm. So it's like the world is watching the resorts, whereas a single family house and eh, not so much, right? Yeah. Right, right. So how have you, have you seen that your property management arm of your business has been able to very comfortably adapt to these different types of uh, properties you guys are bringing in? So yeah, the, I, I'll just refer back to the, the kind of the culture of the people I try to hire, right? You know, I, I tell everybody, listen, real estate is in cycles. Some things go up, some things go down. But the good news is, as long as you're adaptable and you have a thirst for learning and, you, you know, you, you want to be cool about it. Yeah, for sure. There's always something to do here. So it's really more about having that internal dialogue with people. And there are times I have to remind them because, you know, I'll, I'll give you a great example. This last year, I bought a uh, 42 units uh, apartment complex in South Tennessee, and it wasn't going well. You know, uh, maybe about half the people in there weren't paying rent. It was a disaster. But I stole the thing for less than the replacement cost. The appraisal, the appraisal I had on it when I bought it already gave me about a half million dollars in equity. You know, I, I was going to work on it, right? And I kind of had to pull them back in. Like, hey, you had to remind them, this is what we do. Is, th- is this messy? For sure. Is it organized? No. The leases we got from the selling real estate agent, are half of them a lie? Yes, they sure are. But <laughs> that's okay. This is, this is what we do. None of this is new language to us. It's just in another state. It's a couple hours away from a plane. And so we're going to figure it out. And we're going to 
We're going to do good for the, for the good tenants, and we're going to do good for the community and make this what, what I think it can be. And, oh, by the way, we're going to make some money for ourselves and the investors. So, you know, this is what we do. I kind of had, had one of those little speeches with them. So time, from time to time, you kind of have to remind them that this is what makes us agile. This is what makes us continue to have something to do in all different kinds of market conditions. Sure. Um, yeah, so it kind of it goes both ways. Got it. Got it. So uh, I'm going to ask you kind of a two pronged question here. The first side of it is what, again, generally speaking, what excites you about the, you know, the, the part of the economic cycle that we're currently in here today. And then on the flip side of that, what keeps you up at night? Well, uh, so what excites me about the current part of the cycle we're in today is we are healed, right? So I graduated high school in 1990. When I started getting into real estate, the Southern California market was just healing from the 1990 real estate crash. And then we had long-term capital collapse in 98 um, that affected my lending. Uh, we had 9-11 occur. We had the dot-com bust. I mean, when 9-11 occurred, they shut down the bond market for a week and we couldn't quote interest rates or close a mortgage loan. That was shocking to me. And so then we had 2008 crash, right? Um, it was the biggest crash ever. So, you know, I'm really happy about today. We have a fully healed real estate market, I would say. There's not a lot of hoop risk running around or risk overall risk taking, but I certainly see... Uh, a little bit of, of optimism with all the high rises going up around in our areas like St. Pete and Tampa. Uh, you know, I've got a few billionaires that are pouring money into, into New York cities now because they see it as a great long-term investment. So I'm so happy and grateful that <laughs> American real estate has returned in a way. And I hope that we can just maintain this for a while so people will just feel more confident and, and, and get involved in it again. I think it's always more healthy when it's robust and there's a lot of people moving around in it. Certainly, you know, if there's another crash, I, I hope to be even smarter and faster than last time to make more money. But that was so it was such a bad crash and it destroyed so many families and homes. I, I wouldn't yeah. I wouldn't say anybody wishes that to happen again. Right. Mm -hmm. No. Um, but what keeps me up at night is, you know, if the stock market keeps having troubles and everything else in the world is no good in the investing landscape. Right. If bond yields are so low, junk bonds are collapsing. What keeps me up at night is that people forget 2008. And they decide we're going we're gonna to hyper leverage everything and then, you know, cut it up and sell it to the world again. So I hope we don't forget the crash. That's what kind of bothers me sometimes. But there's not really nothing on the horizon that gives me total heartburn or keeps me up at night. I, I think we're in a pretty good spot for now in the next 36 months or so. As long as everybody yeah. looks at it on a per deal basis and kind of keeps a level head, mm -hmm. you should be fine. You know, I think the guys that are really have a headache right now are the speculators, the flippers. Yep. It's getting harder for them. But that's a different model and it's no harm, no foul, right? It's just different. I, I think I try to look at things from an investment standpoint. You know, when I buy something, I'm, I plan on having it for a while. So it's a, just a little bit different view. Yeah, I was going to ask that question as well. I mean, what is the long-term horizon of uh, Equial? I mean, as far as your holdings are concerned, and I know that we're all, you know, we're not considered sellers either, but we, we will sell things here and there. And obviously everything's for sale at the right price. But I mean, what's your overall philosophy of... Um, so you know, I, I plan to do this rest of my life. Yep, me too. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I plan to do this the rest of my life. So I'm, I'm 47. So uh, maybe when I'm 90, I'll quit doing this. So that, that's my horizon on anything. <laughs> um, does, your wife, right. does your wife agree with that? If you're going to do this up to uh, your 90s? As long as she gets to travel, I think she's, you know, she's I'll make okay. sure she listens to this show. She might, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. But uh, I think that um, a certain asset classes will always be going up and down and moving around. You know, uh, we're very lucky today because the, the properties we purchased several years ago uh, cash flow a lot of our uh, our endeavors today, mm -hmm. um, which allows us to take perhaps a little bit more risk than, than some people. But, you know, and I, I always think we're going to be tweaking the portfolio. You know, neighborhoods change, areas change. And, and investors ask different things of me. You know, uh, like today, investors are asking me to diversify outside of Florida. It's not enough that I'm in Central Florida. They would like to see uh, maybe 50% of my portfolio in the next few years not be in Florida due to the highly publicized hurricanes and the global warming. So, yeah. so the, the, I think that we'll always be changing and evolving and moving around with it. But ultimately, our job is the same. It's to, mm -hmm. it's to find that dislocation and create value for somebody. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Well, yeah. you've been at this quite some time now, uh, buying the real estate since I think you said, uh, what was it? 2009, you started buying of what you currently own today. Prior to that, you were in the, the lending side and the mortgage business. But going back, uh, whether you want to go back in time to 2009 or go back even prior to that, but just knowing what you know today, overall, your entire real estate experience, if you can go back and give yourself some advice at one of those two points in life, what would that advice be? 
I, I would think my advice to, to that, to that Brian would be, you know, be more greedy when others are fearful, you know, back, I, and I'm referring back to 2008, 2009, cause that's the most recent and the deepest for me. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I, I lost the most personally and professionally in that crash. And, you know, when you watch CNN every night, you tend to believe what they're saying at some level, you know? And so what I should have done is just stay focused on what I was doing and just believed in myself more and run harder and faster. I mean, I'll, I'll share this with you. It's, it's going to sound absurd now, but there was a time back in 2010, I turned away tens of millions of dollars of capital because I, I wasn't confident I could, I could deploy it correctly. And I was a little bit concerned about this double dip recession and the end of the world still coming. So, but in retrospect, I should have grabbed the capital, negotiated great terms and bought anything, you, yeah. you know? So, so what I'm going to say is like, my, my big thing is be, be greedy when others are fearful and, and, and maybe tune out, tune out the pundits a little bit more. Yeah, no, no, I think that's great advice. Obviously, in hindsight, we would all go back and uh, and buy a lot more. And kind of my, my my takeaway was, it's it's interesting. Like we all know the saying of you know buy low, sell high, and uh, you want you definitely want to be buying when there's blood in the streets. But it's it's a little challenging to do when it's your own blood in the street. So, but if I could go back in time, <laughs> uh, it surely would have uh, been a lot more aggressive during those uh, first couple of years uh, immediately following the recession. But I still had the opportunity to capitalize on on a good bit of it, just not the 2009, 2010 era. But uh, in any event, I, I really hope. Well, that's, that's that all that matters. As long as you got her involved. I tell you oh, this, absolutely. I, I, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of people I run across that just didn't get involved at all, and they they want to they want to talk to me about it last year. I'm like, wow, man, it's it's too late. You know, it's it's that day's passed. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you shared a lot of gold nuggets with us here today, uh, Brian. Tons of great information. I, I really appreciate you sharing your story, and being you know completely open and transparent about even the challenging times that you faced back during the the recession. It obviously molds us as as individuals, as business folks, and. Honestly, you wouldn't be or I wouldn't be where we're at today if it wasn't for those challenging times that we went through. And so I'm very grateful for that. I didn't realize it at the time. I'm sure you didn't either. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of hard to see the forest through the trees at that point. But in any event, if you had one final uh, last golden nugget of advice or wisdom that you could leave with our listeners today that might inspire and motivate them as they progress in a real estate investing career, what would that one last golden nugget be? Always be learning. Always be learning. Yeah, even today, you know, uh, I, I seemingly have, and, and I'm, I'm where I'm well ahead of anywhere I thought I would be at this point in my life, especially when you know, you know from 2000 to 2009. But even today, we're always learning and growing. You know, we're we're taking on projects that that are training us new things. I mentioned I think earlier the EPA thing is on my mind. You know, it turns out that someone in my office is kind of good at processing that paperwork. So uh, we can, you know, as long as you're willing to put up with a headache, you can get land hundreds of thousands of dollars off because there's an EPA issue with it uh, and you can just work through it and go. So mm-hmm. it, it's a totally new thing for us. It's kind of weird and, and, a, and a weird kink in the real estate. But at the end of the day, when I, if I have that title, and that land cleared up, I may, I may very well double my money in 12 months. So, mm-hmm. and then I have something that anybody can see value in. So always be learning, always be growing, no matter where you're at or what lane you think is the best lane for you today. That's fantastic advice. Well, Brian, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. And uh, folks, if you want to learn more about Brian and his company, you can go to his website, which is equialt.com. And that's E-Q-U-I-A-L-T.com. Again, E-Q-U-I-A-L-T.com. And Brian, that's all we have, my friend. Look forward to staying in touch. And uh, we're close by, so I'll have to buy you lunch one day here in the near future. That sounds great. Look forward to it. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com. We'll see you next Monday morning.